Right, hi everybody. Um, we're just waiting a couple of minutes while a few more people join. Um, I'm sure there'll be more people join us as um, we go throughout the webinar, but they can join us when, when, they're, when they're well and ready. So, um, hello everybody. Um, and thank you for joining us for this webinar. There you go. Where we're talking about moving to Gibraltar from the UK. Now we've done a similar similar webinar before, and, and I look back at it, it lasted an hour and ten minutes. So we're going to try and keep it a bit more compact today. Um, so we won't go into the minutia, but if there's anything that interests you that you hear today, and, and you want more details on, or you're serious about moving to Gibraltar, then we will supply our contact details at the end, and, and, and feel free to reach out to us. Um, so I'm Matt Penfold, Advisor and Director here at Fiduciary Wealth. I'm here with Paul Career, our Managing Director, and we're joined by G Joyce Newman at Century 21 Properties, Gibraltar, who we will introduce properly later. Um, so if we just quickly cover, so I run through what we'll be covering today. So we will do a brief introduction of Fiduciary Wealth Management and then a brief intro to Gibraltar itself. Um, as this webinar covers relocating from the UK, we will cover exiting the UK and, and some issues surrounding the UK domicile that is often overlooked. Then we will cover the residency options, all those amazing tax benefits of living in Gibraltar and the tax planning opportunities um, that come with that. Um, then Joyce will, will join us and, and talk about the Gibraltar property market. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the relationship between Gibraltar, Spain and any agreements that include the UK. And then we'll answer a few frequently asked questions, uh, an additional point of advice, and, and then we'll open it up to questions at, at the end. So um, you may have questions as we go throughout. Feel free to submit those using the Q&A section of the webinar, we will get to all those at, at the end. Um, but I see there's an early question is ask about the, the recording and, and um, yeah, we'll be able to distribute that um, and, and link you to our YouTube channel that um, will show our video. So feel free to browse that and, and like and, and share those with, with people who might enjoy it. So fiduciary wealth management, who are we? Paul here, one of our um, one of the founding partners. If you can tell us a little bit about us, please. Yeah. Um, thank you for tuning in this afternoon. Um, I started my career in taxation, so I worked for six years in, in the Inland Revenue, and then I transitioned to financial services in 1989. So I have a diverse background in in private banking and the wealth management sector for 33 years. I'm a chartered banker by profession and I co-founded Fiduciary Wealth in 2007 together with my partners, the owners of the longest standing Ban One law firm in Gibraltar, uh, which, which was established in 1892. The name of the firm is Isola's 1892. So we're a bit quirky. We ha happen to have legal roots, but equally we have accountancy roots. So we are a member firm of MGI Worldwide. It's a top 20 ranked global accountancy network. Uh, in fact, it's one of the oldest formed in 1947. And today it is represented by 10,000 professionals across 460 locations, 100 countries, seven continents, one, $1 billion in revenue. So we've got those legal and accountancy routes as well as our wealth management practice. Uh, personally, I'm a great believer in the need to engage in a broader dialogue, to develop deeper relationships and provide more client-focused solutions. That has been the driving force of the business from the very beginning. Um, I'm also a strong advocate of the need to offer holistic, impartial and tailored advice, which stands the test of time. Um, our business, Matt, as you know, is is a family office approach. So we provide a highly personalized service where each and every relationship is highly valued. So relationships are at the heart of everything we do. We always keep the long-term in mind. 
We're not interested in, in providing short-term solutions, extremely passionate, passionate about shaping the wealth of the expatriate community through tax-led wealth management advice and, and ethics is what drives us forward. So yeah, a very simple mission. We help expats and their families. Okay, and, and Paul, just to expand on that very slightly, yeah. um, what would you say the differences between the fiduciary wealth approach when it comes to looking after clients who, who um, are abroad? I think the, the difference in approach is, as I said, that it's all about the relationship. And, you know, whenever I sit and join a panel of speakers in London on, on financial and lifestyle considerations of moving abroad, be that to Spain, Portugal, Gibraltar, or elsewhere, um, I'm, I'm always, it strikes me that a lot of our peers talk about their internal journey how the company has grown, in what countries they're represented, what licenses they have, but rarely do they speak about the lifeblood of the business, which are the clients themselves. So I think a key differentiator is that we're all about the clients. Okay, thank you. So we're here to talk about Gibraltar. Um, so you may know a lot about Gibraltar, you may have family, friends here, and visitors over the years. Some of you may be relatively new to, to Gibraltar, so more for, for those people. Gibraltar is a, a self-governing overseas British territory based at the, the southernmost tip of the Iberian Peninsula. Therefore, we, we benefit from this beautiful weather um, throughout the year. Um, and Gibraltar is a nice mix. You get the Mediterranean weather and, and culture and, and outdoor lifestyle, but then we still have English law, language and, and currency. Whether or not that's a great thing with the news at the moment, we will see. But, um, and there are multiple tax advantages to become a Gibraltar resident, which we, of course, will, will cover later. Um, but there's a lot of Gibraltar is an incredibly popular um, place at the moment, and it's a thriving business center. We, we have financial services here, a lot of tourism, huge gaming and, and uh, DLT, blockchain firms, attracting a lot of talent and, and a lot of people who, who want, to, want to be here. Um, just when we talk about residency with Gibraltar, um, it's very clear to be a Gibraltar resident you um, need to spend 183 days here. Uh, the other option is you spend 300 days in Gibraltar spanning three consecutive tax years. Um, so yeah, we're talking about moving from the UK to, to Gibraltar. Um, so right, first step, planning your UK exit. What, what do people need to consider, Paul? Well, there are many different factors that will determine whether you remain UK tax resident or not, the number of days you physically spend in the UK during the tax year is an important consideration, but it's not just the only factor to, to consider. You need to look at the um, pattern of your presence and your connections to the UK, which could include things such as family, property, your working life and your social connections. So when it comes to exiting the UK, you look at the UK state for your residency test 2013. This allows you to plan the date in which you become non-resident and determines how much time you can spend in the UK without accidentally re-triggering residency. Because very often I had a chat with, with a couple earlier this morning and all, there's always, you know, um, be it parents or grandchildren, there's a draw there to go back. And you have to be very mindful of the ties you retain with the UK and how many days that allows you to return in any tax year. Because what you don't want to do is to restructure your financial affairs and then find out that, you've, that you haven't exited it properly. So... Um, Ideally, you should always exit at the end of the UK tax year, which is the 5th of April, simply because it's a cleaner break and it's, it's the best way to do that. But, but in any event, um, 
wherever you go, the taxi will not run concurrently with the UK. Spain and Portugal run on a calendar year basis. Gibraltar runs from 1st of July to 30th of June. So there's a, there's a degree of overlap. But if you're leaving the UK, then, then our advice is always to exit at the end of the tax year. Um, there are three specific situations where you're allowed uh, or you automatically, uh, HMSA allows you to automatically exit the UK. So if you seek employment um, elsewhere in the third country, if you move to Gibraltar with intention of of, um, of um, seeking gainful employment, then HMRC allows you to have a split tax year. If your spouse or partner is, 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 has found employment elsewhere, meaning Gibraltar, then again, HMRC allows you to split the tax year. And thirdly, if you um, dispose of your main residence or, or do not have any residence in the UK, Again, then you, you are able to exit the UK at any point of your choosing, not just at the end of the, of the tax year, which is the 5th of April. And the third option, of course, is that it's some random date, but then you run the risk that you have to argue with the HMRC whether it's properly done or not, which is not really something you should even consider. Nobody wants to argue with HMRC, really. No, no, no. There's only one winner, yeah? yeah. So that's how it works, basically. Okay. So I think that generally people are either not aware or do not go back and, and look at those ties. They think, yeah. and very often I hear, oh, it's the 90 days or it's the 183 days. They haven't really put in a lot of effort and thought into that. So one of our services is to offer a review of the test. Yeah, which makes sense because I think moving to Gibraltar is very clear. Yeah. But it's so easy to travel back to the UK and, and people okay. have connections there, which is great, but they have to be careful not to re-trigger UK Absolutely. tax residency. Okay, good. So that's UK. Oh. There's one other thing worth mentioning. Uh, again, because it, it, it was part of a of a discussion I had this morning with a with a client after during our Zoom meeting. You know, the UK has generous tax advantages for those who are tax resident. So if you're exiting the UK before the end of the tax year, you might want to dispose of your main residence while still a UK tax resident. Right. Because that allows you to do it, I believe, free of UK yeah, capital the gains. Main resident, absolutely, yeah. yeah. And if you still think you want the base in the UK, the following tax year, you buy a little base which is maybe a fraction of the cost. So you can see what we've done here. Yeah. We've exited with no capital gains tax whatsoever. And then in the following tax year, well, you, 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 you um, buy a small little base from the proceeds of that sale, yeah. but you've, you've avoided the CGT. So that's a, that's a nice takeaway for, for those who've tuned in today. No, no, it's a good idea. You kind of crystallize that game. Absolutely. Why it's classed as your main home, no CGT. Exactly. Okay, no, that's, that's a very good one. And so that really covers UK residency, but then there's also UK domicile, which from my experience is, is overlooked and, and really misunderstood, especially how that affects someone's UK inheritance tax. Can you tell us a bit, bit about that? No, absolutely. I think um, the good news is there's no inheritance tax in Gibraltar. The bad news is that you're likely to remain exposed to UK inheritance tax by virtue of um, your domicile of origin. Um, because in the UK, IHT is based on domicile rather than on tax residency, like in Napoleonic law countries, Spain, Portugal, Italy, France, pro probably Greece as well, uh, is based on your domicile of origin. And that is something you acquire at birth, where you are born and, and often where, you, where your father is born. Um, so whilst you can claim and acquire domicile of choice uh, by simply by settling in another country with the intention to remain there permanently, 
uh, we find that this is always fraught with difficulty. There's no fixed rules. The burden of proof always falls on you um, to show that you've acquired a domicile of choice. And, and besides that, it, it's in, in our experience, it's not uncommon for Brits to return to the UK temporarily due to ill health, maybe for a year, or perhaps following the death of a spouse. Um, and that would again re-trigger UK domicile, even if the HMSE were to accept your domicile of choice, say Gibraltar, right? Um, so theoretically, you can avoid UK IHT after five years of non of non UK tax residency, but in practice, it's more complex than that. And ties such as business interest, property, social connections, family. Uh, and then something which is over, often overlooked, which is intentions, can result in you being considered UK domicile for IHG. So um, even the most insignificant tie can be challenged. And HMRC have, have been known to rely on the most tenuous of grounds to dismiss claims that an individual has, has um, a domicile of choice. Uh, which has been acquired. I think the most high profile case is that of uh, the Welsh actor, uh, Richard Burton. He lived for many years in the US. He moved to Switzerland in 1957. He remained in Switzerland for 27 years. He passed away in 1984. And the UK tax authorities made a successful claim on his, on his estate on the grounds that he never actually relinquished his UK domicile notwithstanding the fact that he had left more than 30 years earlier. Um, and their claim was success, successful on the basis that he purchased a burial plot in Wales and he retained his emotional ties and therefore he, remained, he maintained emotional ties with the mother country and he always intended to return to the UK prior to his passing. And apparently the fact that he um, was buried in the colour of Wales and holding a Dylan Thomas, um, a copy of Dylan Thomas poems, uh, supported the HMSC's case that he never actually left. So his estate of five million uh, was taxed. At, he paid it. There was a tax liability in his estate of two point four million, and um, yeah. So that is a perfect case in point. The good thing is that being non-UK tax resident does provide you with opportunities if, and, and tax planning opportunities uh, to restructure your financial affairs and potentially completely eradicate your liability. But like everything else in life, it has to be done in good time. But, but, but the opportunity is there to just reassess your net worth and what measures you can take to start, start reducing that liability potentially to nil. And that's what we, we always recommend. Yeah. So I think the message is that uh, given half a chance, HMRC would, would put a claim on someone's estate and, and the tenuous of links can allow them to do so. You're not there to defend yourself because Absolutely. you passed away. So best to, best to plan in advance and, and there's plenty of opportunities. Absolutely. Wonderful. So we'll move on to part two and... and we call the post-Brexit reality for Brits moving to, to Gibraltar. So um, there's been a few changes of late, and, and Paul, you, you can tell us about those? Yeah, there's been some interesting developments. The first one being that post-Brexit, you know, for example, one of the routes to residency, which Matt, I think you're going to cover, yeah. is self-sufficiency. Now, self-sufficiency um, was a scheme which required EU approval because when it was given birth, we were part of the EU. So being a tax scheme, the EU would have to um, accept that the scheme uh, fulfills the requirements, that it is not a tax fudge, that there's some taxation and so forth. So once we exited the UK, the scheme no longer had EU approval. So, and, and furthermore, um, application for, for residency um, fall under uh, 
uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, it, it, it is quite interesting because it, it falls under the Gibraltar's Immigration Asylum and Refugee Act. And basically what that act says, or, the, or, or that act uh, bundled together EU nationals and British nationals, because it was EU approved. They considered uh, foreign nationals from the European Union as one single entity. Right. So there was no distinguishing between British nationals and European nationals. And the British and the local government have never repealed that act to draw a distinction between European nationals and British nationals. So that means, and the scheme for self-sufficiency no longer requires EU approval since we've Brexited but none, nevertheless, it hasn't been tinkered with to recognize the new economic reality, right? Yeah. That is a different game altogether. So the effect of that change is that Gibraltar hasn't really, by not repealing the act or not amending the act, British nationals are left in limbo. I think it's not, I think it's probably, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a deliberate, deliberate act. Um, so that now they've, they've made it more difficult to become tax resident on self-sufficiency grounds. And basically there's two routes to market now. You, you either transfer your medical rights from the, uh, from the UK National Health NHS, yeah? yeah to the Gibraltar Health Authority. Yeah. So you, you transfer your medical rights and that is one avenue to self-sufficiency. And the other one is, is becoming, because again, they keep changing and tightening the rules, is um, becoming self-employed here. And there's different ways of becoming um, self-employed, but, but you have to be in receipts of uh, employment income. And then, of course, then we have the budget in July, and you know, politicians have been talking about tightening the rules for self-sufficiency and taxation. And I think the messages have been very convoluted and not clear at all. And I'm not quite sure whether the, whether they are clear themselves on how they will treat uh, new applicants on self-sufficiency grounds. I think the bottom line is that they're becoming more stringent and they're looking at things with a fine tooth comb. And the argument is, you know, post pandemic, we need to raise more income yeah. and revenue. They can't just come here and, and uh, not pay any tax on self, as they used to do under self-sufficiency. So each case is different. It becomes more cumbersome. That doesn't mean the doors are closed, but it means the process uh, requires more effort and time and apart to secure that residency certificate. I also understand that, and worth mentioning quickly in passing, that one of the problems um, the Gibraltar government have had is that there's a lot of people moving to Gibraltar from the UK, um, because as you know, Gibraltar offers um, grants to children uh, to, uh, to university. Yeah. So whereas in the UK, you know, a child uh, goes to university and ends up with a debt of whatever it is, 30, 40, 50,000. In Gibraltar, the, the, the local government, if, if you, the university in the UK, if you secure the grades, they will provide a very generous package that covers most expenses. So apparently there's been an influx of British nationals bringing their families along, knowing that this is a massive saver. And under self-sufficiency, they wouldn't pay any tax, bring the family along, and then they would have the freebie. This is not um, a, 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 this is, a, um, yeah, this is what I understand. No, I, I think it's- uh, And they're typing the rules. Yeah, I think it's something we've um, heard from a reliable source. And, and exactly. No, it makes sense. And the family comes with their 14 year old child, do a couple of years in a Gibraltar school and, and therefore, Okay, when they're old enough, pack them to a UK union. It's yeah. a saving of, of probably these days ten grand plus yeah. with all the additional with, without without contributing to local exactly. uh, tax coffers, you know, and, and availing themselves of the 
amenities and the services locally. So for a small economy, it's not a sustainable model. Yeah, no, good. And I think there's two things to add. I think when you talked about the transfer of, of the NHS rights from the UK, I understand that that's only for people of pension all ages. So you have to be in receipt of your UK state pension, yeah. which is 66 or 67 yeah. um, before doing that. And, and just to really kind of reiterate what you're saying, Paul, the, the process of gaining residency is, is so much more complex these days. And, and we, of course, help people gain residency and we're, we're able to help them kind of navigate through that. But we have heard um, firsthand that, that there's a lot of um, residency applications being rejected. Absolutely. Just because there's so much demand and, and is exactly what you're saying. I think they're kind of tightening up. So um, really, you need to be able to support your argument to gain residency. And, and maybe that's where we can provide a little bit of um, backup with that. No, we, we I mean, it will require much more work and much more thought. And, you know, applications have become more expensive in, in the process yeah. because it's not straightforward anymore. But there's, there's routes to market, not for everyone, but, but in the majority of cases, um, provided taxes paid and, and, and thing, things might be able to be structured both tax efficiently and secure the residency as well. Absolutely, good. So that takes us nicely onto the residency options. Yes. And, and when we spoke about this before, and I, I, I won't go into too much detail. Um, the main reason for that is, is each, everyone's circumstances is different. So we can give every single detail about residency, someone takes that away and, and then they apply for the wrong residency and they've, um, they, they've made a wrong move. So I'll just cover it in brief. We've talked about self-sufficiency, which for those not working is effectively on hold. Um, uh, wonderful kind of tax benefits through that, um, which we will cover the kind of tax benefits in, in, in later, but there's difficulty with that. And, and if that's something that you've seriously looking at, maybe it's kind of worth having a conversation with us so we can look at the options that are available for you. Now, one of the other options that you may have heard before is, is category two. So this is a special tax status that actually requires individual approval by the, the financial director here in, in Gibraltar. And the purpose is to attract people of, of higher wealth. So you have to have a, a net wealth of minimum two million. Now, the, the main benefit of, of the CAT 2 is it limits your um, annual taxation. So a minimum of, of 37K as it stands and, and a maximum of just under 45K. Now, the CAT 2 can be very complicated. I think we've all come across um, people promoting and pushing people towards CAT 2 when it's not suitable for them. So again, if, if it's something you're interested in, we, we should have a conversation with you and we can cover what the requirements are for that. Um, there's other schemes, there's a high executives possession, pos possessing specialist skills, not easy to say, uh, maybe not as easy to obtain as well, but um, it requires you to be employed in Gibraltar and that you've got certain skills that are in demand here. Um, uh, similar to the CAT 2, it, it limits the amount of, of tax you pay, so it limits your annual tax um, to just over 43,000. Now, the figures that we're giving today, they're the, the most up to date, which come from the budget, which was in July, was it? Correct. Where they've increased taxation um, on a temporary measure, actually, apparently. So, um, taxation in, in um, and, and wait, sorry, when I talk about the residency, I, I guess the last one is, is to cover, you can register here on a self-employed basis, uh, which is an interesting avenue for people. It's, it's one where helping people with at the moment gain residency and, and it's still an option available for people if, if, if that does interest you. So it leads us on to, to the kind of tax benefit. So schemes like CAT2 and, and HEPs, they limit your income tax burden. For those in employment or, or working here, then the tax in Gibraltar is, is still, you know, a lot lower than you would be used to in, in the UK. Now, the main difference in, in the UK, um, like most countries, we, we have a 
tier tax rate. So effectively, the, the more you earn, the higher your tax rate. We can see it's been updated um, last week with the new mini budget. Gibraltar is slightly different. It works on a bell curve. So your tax rate progressively goes up until you reach the maximum, and then it goes down in, in, in value as well. So that works out. Well, before the budget in July, it worked out that your uh, maximum average tax rate would be just 25%. That's gone up to 27%. I believe it's, it's for two years and, and they intend to reduce it down again to, to 25%, but increasing the tax areas is just one of the measures that they've introduced post pandemic. Um, I think they've so. tweaked as well with the tail end of the bell. The bell. Okay, yeah. So I'm not quite sure if it's a bell now. It might still be a bell, yes. but they've tried to uh, I, yeah. try to increase taxes to make it, you know, not not progressive as most yeah. taxation systems, but certainly the moving away from the bell model. I, I think it's more of a kind of misshapen bell now. Yeah, it's exactly. It's, it's losing its bell. <laughs> um, and so, apart from the low income tax rates. You're a resident in Gibraltar, you can benefit from no VAT, no VAT, no wealth tax, which can be seen in other um, countries nearby, no capital gains tax, no savings tax, or no gift tax. Um, corporate tax in Gibraltar is, is now 12 and a half, previously 10%, but, but has been increased. And one interesting part is it is possible to receive dividends from your UK company without tax, both in UK and Gibraltar. It's a bit of a kind of quirk of, of the taxation. Um, but again, if, if that may interest you and, and you have a UK company that you can draw dividends from and you're seriously considering moving to Gibraltar, then I think that's something we should have a conversation with on a one-to-one on -one basis. Um, uh, we say no capital gains tax, one kind of caveat on that is, is um, for those disposing of, of UK assets such as UK shares, um, the, there will be no capital gains tax but you have to be out of the UK or a non-UK resident for six years I believe, so five clean tax years and in, in, in year six, so it's not a case of you can come to Gibraltar, dispose of your, your shares, and, and then return in year two. You need to be out of the UK for, for that period of time. And, and the last thing that we will cover in, is um, pension income. So if you have a Gibraltar pension, um, tax on, on local pensions is set at just two and a half percent. So that takes us nicely on to the tax mitigation options and, and succession planning opportunities. Um, because we talk about the pension in, in, in Gibraltar, so you can have your UK pension and you can continue to pay um, tax at, at the normal tax rates, or you can transfer your UK pension to a, a Gibraltar QROS. And there's many benefits to that. I've already covered a great one. So they are taxed at just two and a half percent you still get access to your 25% tax-free lump sum. It is possible to, to have 30%, but that's if you've been in Gibraltar for a certain amount of time. I, I believe it's over five years. Um, for those that are close to their lifetime allowance, and um, I think we've been speaking to a few people about this recently, Paul, um, with your UK pension, at some point you will have a test. They call it a benefit crystallization test, and that tests the amount of your pension or pensions against the allowance, which is currently just over 1 million, 1 million and 73,000. Now, if you breach that limit, you have to pay tax on that 25% if it's income or more if it's a lump sum. But if you transfer your UK pension to a Gibraltar QROPS, before you breach that limit, then it can continue to grow um, with no further test, no further tax. And the final one, unlike UK pensions, if, if um, the pension member or owner dies after age 75, there's no tax liability to the, the beneficiaries. Whereas in the UK, if you die after 75, 
you pay tax at your margin or your beneficiaries pay tax at their marginal tax rate. So that's a QOPS. It's a very interesting to move your UK pension to. A lot of tax savings that you can make from that. Now, earlier we talked about UK inheritance tax and, and how many individuals remain um, UK domicile and, and therefore will be exposed to UK inheritance tax. Now, an option you have available is a Gibraltar QNOPS, very similar to a QROPS, the same tax benefits, no capital gains on the growth, income is paid at just 2.5%, um, but the main difference is a QNOPS is, is funded via a lump sum investment. So you've got a large amount of cash, or maybe a house sale, shares, sale of a company. If you contribute that into your QNOPS, that is immediately outside of your estate for UK IHT. Even if you return to, to the UK at a later date, the only caveat must be that the QNOPS has to be a genuine retirement vehicle. Um, so it has to be in line with your wealth, your age and, and future income requirements. So what we mean by that is if somebody reaches age 75 and above and, and said, right, I now want to protect against UK IHT, they set up a QNOPS and, and HMRC would rightly look at that and say, look, that's only set up to avoid UK IHT. It's one of those things that we always advocate planning for in advance, especially against something like UK inheritance tax and, and a QNOPS is a very good example of that. The sooner you make that investment, the larger sum you can protect against IHT and invest in, in the QNOPS. So we move on to part three and, and Joyce, we will bring you in. So let me unmute you. Oh no, that's asking me to okay. You've done it yourself, thank you. So, Hello there, one and all. Joyce, I will just make a quick introduction. So Joyce Newman, Managing Director and Owner of Century 21 here in Gibraltar. Um, Joyce purchased the Gibraltar franchise over 10 years ago. Um, previously worked in corporate finance. Joyce has built and sold a number of businesses over the years, has a vast array of experience in property development and, and finance, also a highly qualified board director. So Joyce has a wealth of knowledge and enables her to be a valuable consultant on business expansion, property portfolios and, and investment strategies. So um, Joyce, thank you for sitting through our bit and, and joining us today. Um, you're here to talk to us about the lifestyle and more importantly property in, in Gibraltar. So maybe just start if you can tell us a little bit about the Gibraltar property market. Okay, uh, thank you for that introduction. That was rather impressive. I have to go and read my CV again. Um, yes, so just to introduce the market here and give you a quick overview. So we have a pretty thriving market. We've been expanding year on year in the market as they're building a lot of developments are going up, which releases a lot of stock onto the market. But what's more important is that the businesses that are coming here, particularly the gaming industries, the cryptocurrency industry, they're expanding uh, left over, um, left over right, nonstop. So that's encouraging more staff who in turn are looking for properties and moving here um, to take advantage of living in the sun and the great lifestyle that we offer here. Um, so the property market, in general, when people arrive, they often rent first. Therefore, we have quite a booming rental market. Um, properties go very fast. So if you see something, grab it quick and get a deposit. So a deposit will secure it and then you can do the paperwork afterwards or change your mind on it. Um, the, once you're here, you can then have a choice whether you're going to stay renting or look around to buy. And obviously once you get to understand the different areas of Gibraltar, which there are about seven or eight different zones, um, then you can think about where in Gibraltar you do want to actually live. Um, the rentals market, I would say, has gone up recently in price, um, particularly since we came out of lockdown in COVID, because the issue is there's been a lot of people moving into Gibraltar. Now, that's been driven by a number of things. We already mentioned the lifestyle here. So people coming out of COVID wanted a better life to so move here. Or they came here because there were, there were a lot of job opportunities here within the gaming, cryptocurrency world, and funds and insurance. I, mean, I just mentioned a few. 
Um, so a lot of people are coming to new jobs with a job, they need to get a, get a home here, have a base. And also companies taking advantage of tax opportunities. So again, they're moving their offices to here. So again, staff coming out. So again, that's been a big drive. Um, obviously the better lifestyle, which I've mentioned, um, and then one that has been touched on, or maybe we're going to come to later, but also some change in regulations um, with Spanish residency and the tax implications if you're working here versus living over there. Um, so those have also driven a lot of people to come in. So that's driven up prices. So apart from rentals, what's also then happened is that the property prices have gone up amazingly. I would say since September last year, property prices have gone up by about 30% and it's just been crazy. And also there's a lot of opportunities price pricing because um, there's limited amount of stock, limited amount of two bed, three bed family owns. Um, so as a consequence, that also has pushed up prices. Um, landlords, um, sellers, um, all looking to charge, charge a bit more. Um, we're beginning to see that flatten now, beginning to level out as things are beginning to calm down. We'll come out of summer holiday though, so I think things are beginning to get busy again, but they still haven't signed the Brexit deal on the border and how we're going to be moving backwards and forwards across the border, so a little bit of uncertainty, we're all waiting, to keep moving it another three months. Um, but the reality is, I think for me, I think the reality is it's not going to affect the market that much. Businesses are carrying on growing here, carrying on bringing in staff. So we've still got a steady flux of uh, people coming to move to Gibraltar and looking for rental properties. Um, I think that probably answers, gives you a nice overview without waffling on too long, I hope, of that aspect of the market. No, perfect, Joyce. I mean, to be honest, I had a few questions pre-prepared for you and you, you covered some of it for us, but I think people are really interested in, in, in the prices and, and you said about this 30% increase, which is um, a little bit crazy, but what, what, what is the main driver for that, would you say? I would just say lack of, lack of stock. Lack of stock, so everybody wants the same thing. We're waiting for some releases and new properties, so there's about four major new developments that have gone up but the stock's not released yet so they've been sold off plan and then once um the, the buyers of the off plan properties they'll either resell them as soon as they own them or they'll be rented out so there'll be more rental properties coming on the market so that in theory it was supposed to happen in june then it was moved to september and now we're looking at november december we're going to see some properties out so as a consequence everything we have has either been sold or if it's up for sale can command a high price or um it's literally snapped up for rental straight away um which you know so i think we'll see a leveling out as the new developments come out but looking at the type of property that is coming um there's not a lot of large family home type environments so, but having said that most people come here um, they come and they look for, a, you know, either a studio or one bedroom anyway. Normally it's a professional couple or a single um, single person working. So they just want a footprint to start until they decide where exactly they want to live. Okay, wonderful. So um, any advice for, for those people looking at the moment? I guess the, the key advice is, is to move quickly, but anything else we could add to that? Um, yeah, I would say I would personally, I would rent. Um, don't too fussy about where, just something that, that suits you and, and your lifestyle. And then once you're here, start to think about um, where you want to be. We have a ruling here that um, there's certain properties. If you, if you go property hunting, you'll see there's certain properties that you have to have a certain status in order to buy them. So for example, three year residency, um, they tend to be cheaper um, than the normal on the market properties and the reason being that they were originally built for the locals for people who live here so um, to enable them to get onto the property market while the rest of the market is kind of booming and prices rattling up so once you've been here for three years you could either rent for three years but once you've been here for three years and you have the correct paperwork you can look to buy one of those type of houses rather than um, the sort of open market home 
haven't said that, an open heart market home. You can rent out, but um, the ones that are um, three year residential, for example, come with restrictions like you're not supposed to rent them out, um, for example. Wonderful. Joyce, thank you for that. That's, that's really helpful, I'm, I'm sure. Oh, my pleasure. Any questions? Uh, you're more than happy to take right. those later. Absolutely, yeah. Any questions you've got for Joyce, feel free to submit these and, and we'll, we'll fire them at, at you at the end. Thank you. Um, so then we, we and, and Joyce, as you mentioned this slightly, but the, the Gibraltar's tax agreement. So unusually, um, there was actually an agreement between Gibraltar and, and Spain. So what are the implications of, of that? Yeah, there was a tax agreement which was signed on the 4th of March 2019. Um, no one expected that agreement to ever have been signed, but, but Spain recognized Gibraltar as a separate tax jurisdiction from the UK, so it had political connotations. Uh, it's a standard international agreement on taxation, but with some political undercurrents, because normally the OECD model double taxation agreements follow a very similar line but this one deviates slightly from the traditional model. Um, but no, they, they've agreed a full and complete um, cooperation in the, in the field of taxation. Um, and the agreement, although signed in March 2019, only came into effect or became law on two years later, on the 4th of March 2021. Um, the effect of that treaty, and I don't think the scope within within this seminar to cover every single aspect because it would take another hour. But basically, one particular point which is of interest: if, if you are a a British or European or any other national currently living in Spain, and you spend at least one complete tax year resident in Spain, and you then decide that you want to move to Gibraltar, which is not unusual, yeah. then unfortunately, post the signing of this international double taxation agreement, uh, Gibraltar and Spain recognize that the individual that has now moved from Spain, it continues to be, notwithstanding the fact that they are tax resident in Gibraltar, continues to be tax resident in Spain for the current tax year and for further complete tax years. So, you know, five tax years, yeah, basically. Yeah. So you, you don't extract yourself from the Spanish net for five tax years. That is quite unusual because even in Andorra, which has similar tax advantages and characteristics to Gibraltar as a finance center, you know, that doesn't exist. There's double taxation treaties with Andorra and the moment you leave Spain, you become Andorran tax resident. In, unfortunately, with regard to this international agreement, it, it, it extended beyond normality when it came to taxation. So the short of it is that, that if you are a British national and you move, if, you, if you're already living in Spain, you know that to extract yourself from Spain is going to take another five years, even if you move into Gibraltar now. But more importantly, if you're a British national thinking, oh, I'll move to Spain, and then if I don't like it, I'll move to Gibraltar. Just bear in mind that, that you're closing that window of opportunity, because if you spend more than one complete tax year in Spain, that's it, for five further years, you're caught up. So that really closes the door yeah. for some individuals that want to explore Spain first and then, but there's another interesting point, which, which I think if I may, I know that we're running short of time, I want to cover that the agreement also recognizes, so both Gibraltar, UK, Spain, recognizes that Gibraltar special tax residency schemes, um, so category to individual, HEPs, and, and um, yeah, and self-sufficiency. The fact that you have those schemes and you've got a certificate under any of those three schemes doesn't mean that you automatically tax resident in Gibraltar and Spain cannot challenge you. Because very often in the past, what we've seen is people being effectively tax resident here, but actually living across the border in Spain. Yeah. So this international agreement recognizes that it's not the certificate itself that guarantees your residency, 
but that there's a reality and that Spain across the border and they have their own rules, 183 days and so on. So you have to fulfill the requirements of Gibraltar, but more importantly, you can easily get challenged in Spain and you have to make sure you don't trigger residency in Spain. So I think those two things are worth mentioning. No, absolutely. I think mean, the first one, especially, that's a kind of red hot tip, oh, really, isn't it? Because, absolutely. Yeah, you think, because I can see people doing that thing. Well, I go to Spain first, see how it is, then I move to Jib, but it's. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a very first the sun and the sangria, yeah. and then you go, I've had enough of this, now I want my tax breaks. Yeah. Yeah. No. Now, off the table now. There you go. It's yeah, there. you can't have the cake and eat it anymore, I'm afraid. What is that? And um, there's been, and, and again, Joyce mentioned it earlier, there's been kind of post-Brexit talks between UK, GIB, the EU and Spain, which, which, are, which are ongoing. Um, I'll put you on the spot here, Paul, but what's an update on those talks? Well, I think the update on those talks is that the talks are ongoing. <laughs> and everyone says that both parties, both the EU and Spain and the UK and Gibraltar, both say that they have a... a um, that they are positively exploring the opportunities and they are and they really want to strike some kind of treaty unfortunately for the uk and gibraltar the treaty is all about economics and the economy and fluidity of the border and in spain uh, and the eu like with northern ireland and southern ireland it's all about politics yeah and the eu extending the tentacles of power and spain having a big uh, a greater grip on, on Gibraltar. And, and I think we are some way in the middle where all parties want to sign the treaty, but there's a lot of uh, red lines on both sides and they don't seem to come together. And I think Joyce is right. I think they said in April by April and then by the summer and now it's the autumn and God knows. I mean, that there's goodwill. So I, I reckon so long as they are still dancing you know they they could something could happen but 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 there's no guarantees on the other hand if they do sign a treaty i think it would be a boon for for gibraltar and, and maybe i know that joyce might may have a different view um because quite rightly people could live on the other side of the border if you have perfect and and you know fluidity because gibraltar would be part of schengen so the free movement within the EU, so we would reverse Brexit, not being part of the EU, but at least for Schengen, we, we move freely. So that's a big plus. Uh, but people could theoretically live in Spain if the border was fluid. I don't believe the border will ever be fluid, but I'm a skeptic. Mm -hmm. um, but, but, but on the other hand, I, I think it could be a boon because I think all those British nationals thinking and planning of moving to Gibraltar, and, and as Joyce mentioned, you know, waiting for something to happen. Can you imagine they come to Gibraltar, they've got pound as their currency, the legal and educational system they understand, uh, British laws and traditions and so on. And then they've got unfettered access to the EU, you know, uh, via Schengen. It's happy days, you know, why wouldn't people come here? So I think honestly, with a shortage of property that we have, because I think there's two big developments. I mean, Joyce is the expert, but Victoria Keys, yeah, uh, and then and then the East Side development, whether well, well, that will ever come to fruition, I think um, I think there could be a, a massive influx uh, of 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 Brits coming across. I mean, we ourselves see it all the time, yeah, with our online marketing. You know how mu how much interest there is in moving to Jib. So uh, no, I think it could be interesting. No, yeah, I mean, there's huge demand now, but as you say, if, they, if there's a fluidity, if you've got the best of both worlds, it's cool. Wow. Why, why not? Yeah, yeah, wonderful. Okay, lovely. So we're almost towards the end. We have a few um, questions that we come across um, quite often, maybe more often than we should. Paul, you have some questions for me. Yes, I, I want to put you on the spot before we close for the day. Yes. <laughs> Three questions. Can you be a tax resident in Gibraltar and live in Spain? Um, very easy one. No. <laughs> People want to do it. We talk about that best of both worlds. But, but no, if you 
want to be tax, and we've seen it in the past, I think you alluded yeah. to it, people want to be tax resident there and, and, and live across the border where maybe the cost of living is, is lower, but no, you can't do it. If you want to be tax resident, you have to live here. Otherwise, Hacienda in Spain will say, give me the money. Okay. And if I'm a bit clever and I said, what if I live in Gibraltar, but my family live in Spain? Is that doable? Okay, well, that's a good one. And, and again, we've come across that before. And, and um, I mean, the problem isn't about Gibraltar, it's more about Spain. And, and if you trigger tax residency in Spain, and the first rule is, like many countries, do you spend more than 183 days there? So you could be living in, in Gibraltar and, and not spending that time. But there's the second rule, which is um, um, where the center of your economic and, and vital interest is. Um, so basically really where your life is. So if, if you're living in a one bed studio flat in Gibraltar, you're working in Gibraltar, but you have your family in their nice villa in Marbella, Soto Grande, the kids are going to school there, you go there every weekend. I think Spain would legitimately argue that's where your life is. We don't care how many days you're spending, you're tax resident here, your family is there. So in that scenario, I would say, I mean, you can do it, no one's saying you can't do it, but Spain will want you to pay tax. So really and truly, you're a tax resident in Spain. Absolutely. And, and one final question. Okay. Is Gibraltar residency only available for Brits or, or is it available? Okay, it's a good question and it's kind of moving parts. I think you covered some of this earlier, Paul, and... and uh, in reality, no. I mean, Gibraltar is a wonderful place that has a mix of, of people from all nationalities. So it's not only for Brits. There are residency con considerations to take into account. People need to meet the qualifying case for, for residency, but it, it's available for, for, for people from other countries. Okay, that's so, good. So, Paul, revenge time. One question for you. Much more kinder, though. What's one piece of advice you would give to anyone looking to move to Gibraltar from the UK? Well, I, th I think it's always a bumpy road <laughs> when you move from one country to another and you need a trusted advisor by your side that can hold your hand through the process and make the journey, the journey easier and ensure it's a smooth and seamless transition to the a new country of residency. I think, you know, failing to plan is really planning to fail. Um, you need a timeline. You need a strategy and you need to have someone by your side who can help you execute it. Uh, miss some key steps, as we've talked about, and, uh, and if you're not properly advised, you, it can prove really costly. You can be uh, penny wise, but pound foolish because you think you're saving money and you think you know what you're doing, but then it catches up with you and you end up with a massive tax liability. Uh, so my advice is always get good advice. So, you know, call us. Um, always plan first, move later. Um, so it's not a race uh, to the finishing line. Um, so, you know, you don't have to be the hare, you can be the tortoise. So long as it's done correctly, I think that's the most important. And then... I think as an aside, but, but worth mentioning again, I go back to my point about UK IHT. When it, can, when it comes to UK IHT, because of the issue of domicile, it's always advisable to plan for the worst. Assume you're going to be liable and hope for the best so that a negative posthumous decision and determination by, the H, by HMRC that does not reduce the inheritance of your beneficiaries, of your children, right? So always look at your UK AIHD liability. How much is that? Plan from the very beginning, mitigate that risk. Early planning, make sure you review everything, I guess, but IHD is, is yeah. one that, you know, being a Gibraltar person could really help you. Okay, exactly. wonderful. So we're, we're at the end. Um, and we talk about planning and planning is, is so important. And, and doing it properly um, in the right kind of sequential order. So we have developed the, the roadmap of a few steps that, that um, you need to take throughout that. Normally I go through that with, with everyone, but I, I won't do that today. We're, we're trying to keep the time down on this. We will be sending out this webinar um, via email in the next couple of days. 
it links to our kind of YouTube channel on there. So feel free to, to have a look and, and on there. So we've reached the end. Um, we open up to, to, to questions. I, I can see there's one there, but I think that was um, from the start from, from Dan. So Dan, I just answered that a second ago accidentally, but will the recording be supplied? Absolutely, we will be um, sending an email to, to everyone who attended today and, and um, have all the information there. You'll we'll be able to view the video and, and the, the slides that we're showing today as, as well. Um, but for those people who've um, no more questions, so I guess that says the information was perfect. Yes, I think, yeah. The only thing I'll re reiterate what you said at the beginning, Please, if you play it again, the, um, we'll send you the link. Please like and share. That would be greatly appreciated, yeah? Wonderful, yeah. And our contact details are there. So for those seriously considering Gibraltar as a, um, a place to, to, to come and live, which I know myself, Paul, and, and Joyce would highly recommend. Uh, but yeah, feel free to reach out if you want to talk to us or you want to talk to Joyce about property as well. And, and We'd love to have a conversation with you all. So, um, yeah, we wish everybody a lovely day. Thank you for joining us, and, and we hope to speak to you soon. Yes, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, Joyce. Thank you, Joyce. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.